Welcome to Real Estate Coaching Radio, starring award-winning real estate coaches and number one international best-selling authors, Tim and Julie Harris. This is the number one daily radio show for realtors looking for a no BS, authentic, real-time coaching experience. What's really working in today's market, how to generate more leads, make more money, and have more time for what you love in your life. And now your hosts, Tim and Julie Harris. Julie just told me something that I'd completely forgotten. Well, I'm not going to say completely forgotten because I don't want to sound like such an idiot. Right. But I did forget. Well, you you didn't realize how close it was. Next Thursday is Thanksgiving. Yeah, a week from today, Thanksgiving. That's, that's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I had, yeah, that was totally slipped my mind. I know. Well, we do have a few spinning plates currently, so it's we okay. Do. Well, it's because you and I have been working so hard in preparation for next year, you yes. know, for our coaching business and the podcast. And Which, incidentally, is what you're supposed to be doing this time of year. <laughs> right. But it sucks following our own advice, Julie, is what Ugh, I'm saying. I know. You know what's so funny about that? Our coaches always say the same thing, especially when they become coaches. It's always like, oh, now I've got to practice what I preach. I know. So, yes, that's true. Well, it is true. I mean, you and I, you were kicking ass at the gym this morning, hating every second of it. Absolutely. You know, it's so funny. People ask us, like, you guys must love going to the gym and working out. No. No. We hate it. I'll tell you, but I did come to the realization, the only thing I What's do that? like about it, mm-hmm. um, when it's over. But right. I like I like the feeling of having accomplished something. Yes. And I like seeing our friends there, too. I mean, yeah. that's nice. But yes, I think that what I would agree with there is the concept of effort equals results. Maybe not immediately, but in the sense that, okay, if whatever else happens today, at least we worked out. Well, that's the thing that's missing in a lot of um, uh, agents' businesses, that if you don't, like when you make a, for example, when you do a proactive lead generation call and then you are, and you do it consistently and you do like, you know, 10 a day or whatever your number is. And you then start seeing yourself get biz, uh, better at it. You then see your start yourself starting to convert leads from it. That's addictive. It right? is, and, the, and, and you yeah. get and you like that result. Yes. You can't really do that with creating or it, basically. We well, can't the, do it sporadically. And all the passive lead generation uh, systems that people do, where they're rating around, they're never going to get that sense of completion. No, and in fact, I would contend it's even worse than that because um, they never really they don't get better faster. Because it, you know, when you're dependent on leads that you buy, it's not really predictable or duplicatable. And since you don't know when, how many, what quality, or whether those leads are really yours or not, it's kind of hard to practice and to improve your skill when it just kind of dribs and drabs on you. So I do want to talk about what we did last night, but Mm -hmm. I want to first uh, uh, remind all of them that they're listening to Real Estate Coaching Radio, which is the nation's number one listened to daily podcast for real estate professionals. And we are going to get back to our 2022 predictions. And we're picking up today on prediction number seven. But last night, Julie and I were invited to a, I would call it a very unique, high-end, posh, sort of almost weird, well, it was weird. It was weird. A party that was all about cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. And it was mostly geared towards people that are crypto novices and might choose to stay so such as your humble podcast coaches yes <laughs> hosts and uh well so we were we were there and we were, there was a hundred other people there and mm-hmm. it was not it was what what did we pay to go a thousand bucks yeah 500 it, piece. It, it was going to a charity which mm-hmm. was great that's kind of yep. how we rationalized you know and it was going to a um i think it was going to education yes. uh, for puerto rican mm-hmm. kids yeah which okay fine yeah that's great, great. yeah mm-hmm. and we made some new friends and the rest of it but we listened to what was you know four people on stage who are trying to explain why cryptocurrency is essentially the way they're there the word you're gonna have to help me here it prof did i say it right i think so yeah it was almost like they were speaking about a religion or a cult and and they didn't answer the the thing i found quite puzzling frankly is not the mechanics of how cryptocurrency works because prior to the thing frankly for the last maybe two weeks i've been reading about it and studying it because you know, I at least wanted to have some base level of, uh, you know, well, the technicality of it. Yeah. Right. Which, you know, is interesting, I suppose. It's, you know, it, it's kind of fascinating, the history of it and the rest of it. Not that fascinating, but fascinating. And I explained it to Julie as best I could because I want to be able to explain it to other people in um, not layman's terms necessarily, but in terms that are non-hardcore uh, nerd. Right. 
right? And I that's something I, I like to take something that's really complicated and break it down to its essence so I can explain it in very simple, simplistic ways so as many people as possible can understand it. And so I'm, it's sort of like um, a decoder ring. That's I was looking for a way to yes. try to sort of de decipher it. Mm -hmm. And truthfully, some of it's so complicated that it's almost undecipherable. But I'll, I'll tell you what I learned. And mm -hmm. this is, you know, you and I hadn't really talked about this, but first of all, um, it goes back to first principles, right? It, it's like Warren Buffett when he talks mm -hmm. about investing. If you don't understand it, don't invest in it. Makes sense. And this, uh, the cryptocurrency aspects is so intentionally opaque and confusing. If you have to have an engineering degree from MIT to understand how it works, it's probably not investable or probably something that's too early to really appreciate as far as what uh, it actually does. That's not the first thing I learned. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I'm not necessarily saying we're pro or against uh, cryptocurrency because there's a libertarian aspect, which I definitely find appealing. Agreed. Um, and the second thing is, is anyone who tells you that they understand cryptocurrency is lying. Yes. That's absolutely what one of my big takeaways was. There is such an enormous depth and breadth to it and different things that you can follow, the analytics of it, the map it's, of it. It's convoluted, though. It is convoluted. Right. And there's so much to it. So I would agree with you. Anybody that says that they're an expert on that is a little sus. Well, they can be us, They can be an expert on a facet of it. But there's four. What did yes. you tell me? 13,000? 13,000. 13,000 different cryptocurrencies. Mm -hmm. Oh, I didn't also mention this to you. What? So I went online and I Googled. Uh, start your own cryptocurrency. Like I wanted to find out a how, how hard guide? it was. Not only a have-to guide. There's companies that will do it for you. YouTube video. It, no, I'm not even making yeah. it up, Jules. You can go there and you can then like. There's step two, design your logo for mm -hmm. your cryptocurrency. Step three, you well, know. Maybe we should make one. <laughs> I mean, just as a joke, right? Hmm. I know Julie's liking that idea. But there's something like you know, fourteen, you know, thirteen thousand different cryptocurrencies out there. There's all – this is the reason why no one can truly understand it. And then there's, you know, the question of utility, and utility is one of these things that's really confusing. But here's really what utility is. Like, for example, utility is what the hell are you going to do with it? So you've got this Bitcoin or you've got this Dogecoin or you've got this you know, whatever it is, and then what, do you, what does it actually do? Now, that was kind of fascinating mm -hmm. because some of them were just rouges. I think – I don't know how else to explain it without using really probably inappropriate words like scams – but some of the cryptos that I came across, they had no utility to them. There was somebody that just went online, decided to start their own crypto, and thought of a clever name, and there it is. Now it's another crypto that's in the world that people might decide to buy. Other cryptos, and this was, I, this is the as frankly, the only aspect I really found really interesting, where other cryptos were used to raise money uh, for what they're calling fintech, and, 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 a lot, and some of them wasn't even directly fintech. So some of these, like... Here's again, I'm getting back to the basics of it. The way to understand some of these cryptos is that they will start selling cryptocurrency to raise money to fund uh, a uh, another idea. And and those those ideas that I stumbled across or those cryptos were kind of interesting. And you and I talked about that. Mm -hmm. So some of them were raising money like we're going to do initial coin offering mm -hmm. and with the proceeds from the, the ICO – you know, initial coin offering, then we're going to, that money is going to be in, invested into creating a, a, for example, I came across one that was uh, generated to um, make free uh, global uh, 5G internet access. Sure. So it's a different way of investing, similar to a stock, but different. Well, it's a different way for a company to raise, to raise money, money. Yes. right? That's uh, unconventional, which mm -hmm. is the, the third thing I like. Is it's a libertarian, and I yes. like the fact, and it's I, global, right? Well, you I know. like the fact that it opens up banking and access to uh, a form of financial exchange to people that don't have access to banks now, because lots yes. of people around the. I mean, just look here. Think of it this way: when we moved to Puerto Rico, on a scale of one to ten, with mm -hmm. you know ten being the ultimate pain in the ass, how hard was it even to open up a bank account? Oh, it was at least a nine. I mean, it was crazy, right? Yeah. And it was because the know your customer rules and because yes. all these other things. And it was just very, very complicated. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what if you're in Africa or what if you're someplace else sure. in the world and you want to purchase something and you don't have normal banking? Mm -hmm. You're going to probably have to essentially uh, 
uh, allow or basically use some credit card that has some you know ridiculous fee if you can even get it yes. because you don't have any other options in order right. to purchase something that you want to buy that maybe you're trying to create a business mm -hmm. and whatever so the fact that digital current or cryptocurrency rather allows you allows people all over the world to have a common means of it's not a common means of exchange necessarily but something that is um, agreed upon that has an international value like gold yes I it's mean, a different level of financial freedom potentially right and so just understanding all of this but I'll tell you what I disliked about it. Mm -hmm. It was not, it had, most of these cryptos really have no utility. They have the promise of a utility. Mm -hmm. And what a lot of these, uh, and there was a, a very, some very wealthy, um, and I, from what we were told, some of them were billionaires in the amount of crypto that they own that were at this event. And when they were talking, some of them were on the stage and they were interesting. And I'm, I'm sure they're great guys. And um, they were talking in, in, in essence, like they were describing some sort of um, utopian vision of the future where sure. it's, you know, some sort of borderless It's world. a bit nebulous. It's yeah. a bit nebulous. And, and it was all, again, it, it felt like, it felt a little too woo-woo to me. Honestly. I agree. And, you know, the thing is that I, I think your top point was was valid that not all crypto is created equally. So don't put it all in the same bucket. Some do some things and some are just there because somebody decided to make it, right? And, and But the people around us, well, they weren't there because they necessarily shared this sort of utopian vision right they were there because they wanted to basically make money yes and and, the, and that's and ultimately mm -hmm. that's what's going on right now well it has value because people believe it has value well and the question is is that enough and i guess it's too soon to tell it well so what is it that you're purchasing when you buy into crypto you're buying the idea that somebody else is eventually going to be willing to pay more than what you paid but okay. that's basically it that's basically it so uh, you and I had the same take on this because I think that we, you know, we tried to do our research before we went so that we had, and, and that's trying to get the right questions in your head to even understand and to go <laughs> deeper, right? right? I mean, you have to do, as we often coach our listeners, do your own research so that you have the right questions. So we, tr we did our best to do that. And I think I was looking for some kind of crypto aha moment. Oh, now I get it, right? And I didn't have that feeling. And I think that if we were going to in that crowd, we would have. For sure. Uh, so there was a great book, and you listened to this as well, by mm -hmm. Jim Rickards. It's a few years out, or a few years ago, called The New Case for Gold. Mm -hmm. And so if you guys are really interested in learning, understanding how fiat currency works and how money works and how all these things work, listen to that book or read that book. It's a little thick, of course, but it's so fascinating. It's so cool. And then the essence, again, looking for the basic elements of what it is that crypto is trying to do. Crypto is removing gatekeepers. Right now, when you guys buy something on a credit card, for example, there are gateways. So there's, uh, and you know, if you've never had a, um, an online business, which we do and we have for a long time, you're getting dinked constantly. You guys know that merchants pay. Like when you buy something from Julie and I, it depends what credit card you're using, but the mer but we have to pay one, two, or three, or sometimes three and a half percent of whatever the purchase price was, just because you chose to use that credit card. Well, where does that money go? That money just doesn't go to one place. It goes to like five or six other places, yes. and those are called little. I mean, I'm they're gateways. Even if you use PayPal, it goes through gateways, and that's why sometimes, or let's say you're purchasing something from an online store. Everybody's had the experience where it says something like timed out. Yeah. That's when a gateway isn't working right. Right. And it could happen anywhere along the road. And those of you who use PayPal, you'll get alerts saying, you know, this gateway failed. We're, we're rerunning at midnight. Well, and a lot of times, well, a lot of times also, you're paying more for whatever it is you're purchasing because the person selling the product to you has raised the price to cover the cost of what it's being, what they're being charged for you to use that credit card. Yes, just and to process your purchase. Just to process it, right. So you could assume, I think this is definitely a safe assumption, that pretty much everything is 2 3 maybe even 4% more expensive than it would be because of the fact that uh, you know retailers, merchants are pushing the cost to accept credit cards onto the customer. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the, again, the thing I like about crypto, I already mentioned one, it makes it so that everyone has access to some form of you know a, a monetary Exchange. system, right? Mm -hmm. But the other thing I like about it is it does get rid of all these gateways. Yes, and I think that's which really is a good sexy. thing. I agree. Oh, it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it lowers, it should hypothetically lower prices. Mm -hmm. It'll make it so that, um, you know, it, it's, here's, again, we get into the, the ether as far as basically the philosophy behind it. And all these crypto people, they wanted to spend a lot of time talking about the philosophy behind it, which are libertarian philosophies and beliefs, 
which are easy to get around, right? Freedom is the essence of what a libertarian wants. Libertarian liberty, right? So those things all make sense. That was appealing. But I would say overall, my experience from it, it was a, what would we refer to it as? We were going because it was going to be a good study uh, of. Uh, oh, anthropology. Yeah, it was good <laughs> anthropological uh, an anthropological Logical. experience. Yeah, well, it was certainly an interesting mix of people. Yeah. And so if we want to tie this in somehow to their real estate <laughs> lives. okay. Well, a lot of real estate people are very similar to crypto people. Absolutely. Because they, they don't like being told what to do. They're independent thinkers, right. entrepreneurial, ambitious. And I, I think, and there, you know, there probably were some real estate people in that crowd, one way or the they, other, you even know, if they're investors. They're all the people hanging out by the bar. Yeah, well, exactly, right? <laughs> no, no, quite literally, <laughs> they were. I know. We, we knew all of them. This is true. <laughs> um, but the the interesting thing was that I, I thought from an anthropological standpoint, uh, because we were trying to get to know new people, I think we probably, I don't think we even knew 50% of the crowd that was there, mm -mm. which was good. And since then, when we were meeting in the gym, several of our friends there said that they wanted for the social aspect. They wanted a little piece of education about crypto, but really they went to meet other people. And so to bring this full circle to our real estate related listeners, we are always, especially this time of year, reminding you to say yes when you get invited to things. Now, this is not our typical wheelhouse, right? This was not, oh gosh, I can't wait to go to a crypto party, right? That's not our normal line of thinking. But we said yes so that we could meet more people and add to our education, as should all of you, even if it's not really in your wheelhouse, right? So maybe you've got somebody in your existing center of influence, your database, a past client, that runs some kind of business that you don't know that much about. And they're having an open house at their business. And they invite you. And your first reaction is, I don't know, that doesn't sound that interesting to me. That's not really my thing. Well, go there to support that person who bothered to invite you and would love for you to be there. And then make it your mission to meet other people and to learn more about it. It just makes totally. sense, right? I mean, that, so the old, it's called the yes game is what Julie's yes talking game. about. Always say yes. Oh, yes. Play, exactly. So maybe y'all should be playing the yes game. My text has just came out. Maybe y'all should be playing the yes game <laughs> for November and December and January. Yeah. Just say yes to everything. Every, see where it leads you. Yeah, definitely. And you know, the center of influence thing, which we've done dedicated podcasts to, it's also part of the Harris Rules book. Um, you know, 10% of your database should do business with you or refer business to you, assuming that you talk to them. And so your job is to do two things. Always be talking to your existing sphere and your past clients, but also expanding that because 10% of 200 is more than 10% of 100 people. Don't make your list so big that you can't recognize people, but you should be actively polishing that sphere. It just makes sense. And, you know, we often coach them also to, especially this time of year, go to charitable events Everyone wants to raise their average sale price. So maybe you go where wealthy people hang out. That would be one idea. Well, that's what we did before yeah. we were wealthy people. That's for sure. And you know, it, it does work. It does work. And, and the, the, especially we, over time, we, we could talk about the preconceived notions that people have about wealthy people being basically completely wrong because they are. Totally. Yeah. Um, but would you guys, if you, when you're ambitious and you are not wealthy and you want to become wealthy, obviously you want to breathe the same air as wealthy people. And what you'll discover is when they, even if they sniff out that you're on your way to becoming wealthy, they will caretake. They will actually appreciate the fact that you're like them. You share the same, mm -hmm. you know, driver. Ambition. You're right. You have the, the same condition. Is that what you just uh, Ambition said? and condition, perhaps. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Well, the same ambition and condition as they do. And they'll appreciate it. And they'll actually start, uh, they'll put you under their wing. And if so, your ego is telling you that rich people are this or rich people are that. Nope. Rich people are just like you. They're just a little bit farther up the, um, in the ladder than you. And we found that we've never found a contradiction. Uh, we've never found a conflict no. with that. I mean, Julie and I, we used to have a car cleaning and detailing business. So we started mm -hmm. in high school and college. And that's where – and we had all kinds of preconceived notions about rich people. But then we started having them as customers. We started taking care of their private planes. We started doing all this other stuff. And we discovered that we were completely wrong about rich people and, you know, the nature of the character of someone that it takes for them to actually accumulate wealth. Because we had suffered up until then of lack of exposure. Well, in public so, schools, and, if we're being honest. All right, <laughs> right. so moving on to point and frame. Reeling it back in. Reeling it back in. Hopefully you guys appreciate the life experiences we're, exper we're going through. We relay these personal experiences uh, because we want you guys to learn and we want to help you. But we also are trying to educate you. Uh, you know, to educate you to then be motivated and then you to get into action. And if, you know, we might say something that sparks an interest of yours and you can go down the rabbit hole and explore it. By the way, I wouldn't go down the rabbit hole of crypto. That, that hole does not That end. was a little odd. Yeah, yeah that was 
<laughs> Interesting, oh, nonetheless. Oh, so the question is, is would we um, invest? And I won't even say invest. Would we speculate, speculate on any crypto? And I would say yes, just because even though it's in its infancy as to what it'll evolve to, there's still money to be made on on the way up. Sure. Because there'll be a lot of other people just from purely from an investment perspective. They're probably I, again, it's not investment. It truly it's isn't. Speculation. It's speculation. But purely from a speculative perspective, it's worth uh, throwing a little bit of money that you have no problem losing down on it. And to and, the, and not expecting to sell it tomorrow for a big product. And what profit. would we invest? Oh, damn it. I keep on saying it. What would, <laughs> because my mind doesn't work. I know. I know. What would we speculate on? Uh, only uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum, those two things. All the others are too, I think, too speculative. Far out there. Yeah. Right. It's too speculative to speculate on. How about that? That's it. All right. So we're getting to house 2022 housing prediction numero siete. Yes. So housing prediction for 2022, number seven, with iBuyers having less competition from other iBuyers and iBuyers having to pay more to find their, uh, their homes to buy, to purchase actual houses, I'm sorry, to pay more to fund their businesses. We predict that iBuyers will start offering and paying less for homes. Historically, they've been paying more. Thus, they won't really be a competitor against your retail buyers anymore. This was Zillow's mistake, right? Well, the reason Zillow was doing it is because Zillow, in the world, there's only one Kleenex. In the world, there's only one dominant brand of anything. And so what Zillow was willing to do was lose massive amounts of money until they couldn't anymore because they were trying to dominate the space and they were trying to kick uh, open doors, but of which they failed to do. And so that's the reason that Zillow was paying, in many cases, retail plus for homes. So they actually became a, a competitor for normal buyers. In markets like Phoenix, it was, you know, they would horrible. bid it up. Right. And so what that point was that Julie just read, what's, what's going to happen is, because the existing I buyers are not going to have Zillow as a competitor overpaying for properties, they can become, I'll dare I say, less competitive, or they don't have to offer as much to this prospective sellers because they know Zillow is not going to try to buy the, you know, buy the mm -hmm. house from, you know, win the. I was going to say buy the listing, but listeners, yep. you guys know what I'm saying. And what's more, it's theorized, and I think this makes sense, that a lot of these I buyers were funding their companies from what amounted to borrowed money. And because mm -hmm. the markets are going to see, as in the lenders are going to see that these, the Zillow was an epic fail, they're going to naturally be a little bit more suspicious about the iBuyer space in general. And they're going yeah. to probably demand that the iBuyers uh, pay a higher interest rate for the increased perception of risk on the iBuyer business model. Thus, it's going to mean that not only are the, there's two points in combination, the iBuyers are most likely going to be uh, offering less, and they're also going to have to be factoring in the cost of their borrowed money, which means that you're not going to be looking at an iBuyer in most cases as a true competitor for a house you're trying to list because the price point is going to be, or what they're going to be willing to offer is going to be double digits uh, less than what it's been, for example, while yeah. Zillow was bidding up the market. A changing model to be sure. Hopefully so some facts sense. for you. In Q3 2021, iBuyers accounted for 1.6% of all homes purchased in the U.S. That's around 28,000 homes, but it was still double the 15,000 purchased in Q2. So the point is, is we don't think iBuyers are going to go away. We think the iBuyer space is going to always be there, but it's going to appeal to the people that are willing to take a, a larger discount on their homes. And in a hot seller's market, you know, again, Zillow's failure is testament to it. You're not going to see as many people that are going to be willing to sign up to take a big discount. But what the I buyers are now is they're going to settle into a space where they're going to, uh, you know, attract people that are willing to maybe take a 15% discount on their house versus that they retailed it with you, real estate professionals, and call that a convenience fee. There will be a certain percent of the population, maybe it's 5%, maybe it's 10% of sellers that are willing to sell their house for what amounts to wholesale. And that's always been true. That's that market's true. always been there. That's right. So the most affected probably has been Phoenix, which was historically the largest iBuyer market, peaked to a new high of 10.8%. This is the first time iBuyers have exceeded 10% market share in a major market, a significant if temporary achievement. Now, while Open Door and OfferPad, <coughs> OfferPad improved their net profit and loss in 2021, benefiting, of course, from record home price appreciation. Zillow's just got worse, as we know, and that's excluding their $304 million inventory write-down, another reason Zillow offers just wasn't working out. Now, that's part of the iBuyer story. Additionally, there's increasing scrutiny of iBuyers from other entities. For example, the Los Angeles City Council voted last week to explore different ways of preventing 
I buy our companies like Zillow, Open Door, Rocket Homes, and Redfin from purchasing single family homes. They state that they believe the I buyer tech driven platforms are pushing home prices even further out of reach. Now, nobody knows if there's a legal way for them to actually prevent that. That's going to be the rest of the story. But I think it's interesting that there's places like city councils that are saying, hey, we don't like this. It's making prices too high. But you probably could uh, create a financial argument that what the city council is saying is true. Yes. Because if you're in Phoenix and Zillow was in there essentially paying retail plus for houses, Mm -hmm. the market was, that's a, you know, a deep pockets buyer that's always willing to pay up and purchase things. Overpay. Overpay in many Mm -hmm. cases. That is going to drive up the comps. It does. You know, but here's the flip side to it. Mm -hmm. They just sold $304 million worth of real estate. I pretty much can guarantee you that's going to- At a loss. At a loss. So what's that mean? They're going to sell it for less than they paid for it. That's going to have to settle into those markets, which means you're going to see appraisal problems. So you're going to see all kinds of, you know, essentially these issues that happen because you have a bulk buyer that's dumping properties on the market in essence. I mean, dumping for, I'm sure they're not under, they're, they're not underselling by that much, but they are selling them for less than what they paid. That will have an adverse effect on appraisals. That will have an adverse effect on seller's expectation of price. Well, think of how confusing it's going to be for a while in Phoenix with 10, almost 11% of their inventory having been I buyer purchases, and some of them dumped back on the market at a loss. So imagine doing a CMA on that. It's going to be a mess. Right? Oh, be- yeah, be- know, because you- it'll look like... It'll look like prices are coming down, won't it? No, Julie, you don't have to do a CMA. You just can uh, go, go <laughs> just do Just use it. your Zestimate. Just use your Zestimate. Yeah, I mean, Zestimate is really so reliable. Accurate. Hold on. Wait a minute. What? Not. Okay. <laughs> Moving on. So uh, 2022 housing prediction number eight. Renters will also feel the pricing increases. Renters will need to save an additional $369 per month on average just to keep up with the increases in home values slash their landlords raising rent as a result. Now, we could be wrong if some sort of legislation passed to control rental price increases, like remember the eviction moratoriums that were passed? I don't think they're going to do that. I think renters are just going to suffer along with everyone else. But rent the rent isn't going up at the same rate as appreciation, but it's certainly going up. Well, uh, what we mentioned this yesterday, national rents have increased by 10%. Yes. Okay, so you can assume, I would assume, the mm-hmm. national rents will increase by another. There is no national rent, but you guys are getting what we're saying here, right? Averages. That yeah. rents will also go up by another 10% next mm-hmm. year. So you're looking at, and now factor in also the, we told you guys the big bugaboo. We feel, honestly, the big prevailing overarching story of 2022. All of our predictions are valid, uh, but it's going to be inflation. So it's how inflation affects all these different facets of people's lives. And yes. inflation is going to feel incredibly personal. Inflation is going to feel like a personal attack because you're going to be experiencing in every turn of the road um, the damaging effects and the psychological effects of higher inflation. For example, if you're a renter and your rent's now gone up by essentially $400 a month, that's $5,000 a year. By the end of next year, your rent's going to go up by, you know, essentially $10,000 a year versus, you know, at what yeah. it was a year ago. Think about that. You know, if you're earning, if, even if you're earning $100,000 a year, if your rent just went up by $10,000 compared to two years prior, that's a big chunk. So unless your income has gone up by mm-hmm. at least 10000 if not ideally more, then you're looking at essentially not being able to have as much money to go out to movies. And, oh, sure. by the way, the movie theaters have raised their prices. Bread costs more. Hey, gas I put gas in more. the truck this morning, and when it wasn't even empty, empty, it was 60 bucks. Yeah, that's crazy. And we don't even live in California where it probably would have cost 75 or 80 bucks. Right. And we're not bagging on California. We were just, just there. And California, it costs more. California gas prices were noticeably more. But do you know the main reason California gas prices are more? It's more regulated, isn't it? it? No, taxes. Taxes. They yeah. have all kinds of taxes as they tack on tacked every on. gallon of gas. Mm-hmm. Tacked on taxes. Yes. Now, one thing I will say about the, the renters suffering higher uh, rent increases is you guys that are in property management know this. Some leases will say that there is a cap of of year-over-year rent increase, and I wonder whether renters are going to get smarter about this in the leases that don't automatically write that in and and write in that you can't, you know, raise it more. I do see renters negotiating more for two-year leases to lock in, and I hear that from our coaching clients, too. We're we're agreeing to two-year leases on all of our properties. I I think it's a good deal for the tenant and the landlord. The landlord knows they've got somebody solid for two years, and the tenant knows they're not going to have a rent increase the next year. The rule that Julie and I have followed for the past 20 years for all of our rental properties, of which we have dozens, 
is always have a property that's a little bit nicer than it needs to be and charge a little bit less than it than the, what the market will bear. And always, obviously, buy things in great locations as best as you can afford. And then you're never going to have a big turnover rate, right? Which is true. That's the rules we've that we've always followed. And, and, you know, anyway, so prediction, housing prediction, numero nueve. Yes, mortgage rates will continue to run at historically low rates with massive pressure from all sides to keep them that way. According to Bankrate, who surveyed a collection of the nation's largest mortgage lenders as of November 12th this year, the average rate for a 30-year fixed mortgage is 3.07%. The average benchmark rate for a 15-year is 2.4%, which is actually down eight basis points from a week ago. That now, really is crazy. You know that, honestly? I mean, 2.4? Holy crap. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, at the current, this is good for you guys to have in, t- in your uh, real estate math brains. At the current average rate, you'll pay $421 per month in principal and interest for every 100000 you borrow. That's so low. But Julie, uh, just stop for a yeah. second. So think about that. If you're buying a $400,000 house, you're looking at before um, I'm, principal and interest, but before uh, taxes and insurance, right. right? You're looking at basically what's going to amount to $1,600, bucks, mm-hmm. maybe $1,700. bucks. And to rent that house, I bet you it would cost oh, yeah. more to rent Absolutely, that house. Absolutely, it would. Yeah. It would. Yes. So, and that's again lower by six dollars and fifty cents than it would have been last week. So they're still staying low and going low. Monthly payments on a fifteen-year fixed mortgage at that rate would cost about three hundred and ninety dollars for every hundred thousand dollars borrowed. Now, here's again. This is something Julie and I have um, been talking about. This. It just think think about what we're telling you here. We just shared with you guys, and again, do your own homework on this. Is that home price appreciation forward slash inflation will be double digits next year. If you can borrow money at what amounts to 3% and the house, if Goldman Sachs is right, inflates in value by 16%, the inflation of the the risen cost on the property or the risen value of the property has more than covered whatever the interest it is you paid on the house. Not just the interest, but in many cases, the repairs and other Mickey Mouse that go into home ownership has been more than covered by the cost, or more than covered by the inflation or appreciation of the property. That does not happen, and historically, very, very frequently, in all but maybe a few very desirable areas around the world. It's pretty amazing. It is amazing. Yes. So, 2022 housing prediction number ten: buyers' agent commissions will continue to erode, become more negotiable, and even optional. Remember, the listing agent always wins. The buyer's agent commission will no longer be seen as an entitlement to the agent. The National Association of Realtors just approved the public display of buyer agent commissions. Agents may not filter based on this, but it is interesting that the, quote, standard commission is no longer assumed. Otherwise, they wouldn't have had to put that into place. Remember, there are no buyers who have to buy, only sellers who have to sell, so make the commitment to being a powerful listing agent. So um, how does this translate? When you're talking with the seller, the seller is going to want to figure out, and if you're not doing this for your seller already, you're at a disadvantage. The seller is going to have access to the data, knowing what the average co-op is in the marketplace. There, you're going to see some num- very consistent numbers. We're not going to talk about commissions. And then you're going to see a low number. Every seller in your marketplace is going to say, why are you telling me to pay you know, one point or uh, half a point greater than what obviously the market, the low, the low benchmark for the, um, you know, for the co-op? And you're going to have to be able to explain that to sellers, but the truth is, and, and this is the unfortunate fact for buyer's agents, in a very hot seller's market, we have already seen across the country that agents are willing to sell properties for $500. They're willing to basically mm-hmm. take, they're willing to give up. There's offers that are being submitted right now from buyer's agents who are trying to basically get their you know buyers into houses and the co-op might be, you know, five apples or three apples, right? Mm -hmm. And they're then sending in an offer where they're offering that they're saying, look, I know you're offering three apples uh, for this, um, you know, the the co-op commission, but I'm willing to do it for half apple. Mm -hmm. Just you, Mr. Seller, keep that extra and give my buyer the house. That's what's going on in the marketplace right now. Because it's a hot seller's market. The sellers have all the control. The listing agents have all of the control. And it's, I think it's also going to happen, and you and I have talked about this before, because the buyer's agent commission is no longer going to be an entitlement to the transaction, it's also reasonable to expect that there will be markets that are ultra competitive where the buyer's agent commission drops to zero. That's true. And that means that buyer's agents are going to have to learn how to essentially present their value proposition to their buyers, just like sellers of uh, listing agents have been having to do that with sellers forever. Having to explain why you should work with me, what advantages I have and why and what my rate for you working with me 
is going to be, and here's how we're going to pay it. You're going to have to pay it out of pocket. You're going to have to roll it into the transaction. So there's the opaqueness of how a buyer's agent is paid. Mr. Seller, listen, work with me. I'm Mr. Buyer. Work with me. Doesn't matter. The seller's going to pay my commission. Working with me is free. That ain't going to work no more. It doesn't really work now. It's really not going to work in some markets across the country. Other markets, it's going to stay uh, as it's always traditionally been. We are not, we are advocates of buyer's agency, so don't under, misunderstand what we're saying. But what we've always been, um, and al- we tell you guys this even though you don't want to hear it, if you want to be relevant in this real estate industry, you've got to learn how to be a listing agent. There's not much of a future working with buyers. You're not looking at a temporary uh, aberration in the marketplace. This is going to be going on for a long damn time. And the problem is, for the buyer's agent's perspective, the problem is, is after it's been normalized that the buyer agent commission is no longer an entitlement to the transaction, or and it's something that the buyer's agents are going to have to negotiate for with their buyers mm-hmm. in markets, it will get like that. That's not going to go back. No, it's not. And in fact, if you guys, some people, you, we always get this when we present a point like this. Oh, that's unethical. That's, um, you know, that's illegal to negotiate the buyer agent's commission. It's always been this way. Well, guess what? Check in with the builders because as soon as the market is super hot, what happens to builders co-op? They say zero or they drive it down to virtually nothing. Not all builders, but this is a very common practice is when they know that they can sell it without you, they, you know, you become less relevant. Are you feeling a little fear and panic because all you know how to do is buy buyer leads? Well, you should be. And that's the reason you need to learn how to become a listing agent. That's the bottom line. Can't give it to you any more BS free than that. Yeah, well, you know what their script used to be working with buyers. Well, it doesn't cost you anything because the seller pays my fee, right? Right. Okay, well, attached to this same vote that NAR just did about having to disclose the co-op buyer commissions, NAR has also said you are no longer allowed to claim that working with you is free unless you're actually not going to take a commission. Isn't that interesting? (laughs) Yep. So guess what? Buyers agents, a lot of you guys are attracted to working on that side of the business because you've been you perceived it's been uh, it's required less skill. It's more of a social end of the business. Well, that's going to change. So listen, guys, we need to wrap. We're going to yes. get up to the rest of our points. How many more points? How many predictions do we have? One, two, three, well, four. Tomorrow's worth. Four. Yeah. And some others that we might think mm-hmm. of between now and then. Sure. So listen, if you've not completed your 2022 business plan yet, there is still time for you to do so. That is your phone. Yep. I'll block it. That's okay. I know. Don't worry about it. Well, it's because our iTunes accounts are are attached. All right. So you need to download your real estate uh, business plan. You need to download your 2022 business plan. Just text 2022 to 47374. Text 2022 to 47374. I'm sorry. I screwed it up. Two, I think. Yep, I did. It was not four. It's two. Sorry, listeners. See, Julie's call in confused me. (laughs) (laughs) Text 2022 to 47372. Text 2022 to 47372. And when you do, we'll text you back. You have to acknowledge that you want the treasure map by texting back yes. And then we're going to send you a link. And here's a little bonus we're doing for November and December. You you would then have the option. You can just download the treasure map and be on your way, which you should at the very least do that. But then you can request a free coaching call with one of our new member coaches. So text 2022 to 47372. And listen, listeners, we really appreciate all the great reviews you're giving us on iTunes and all the other platforms. Uh, If you're looking, and I know many of you are, you've been really staying up late thinking about what you can get Julie and I for Christmas, (laughs) right? I know you're thinking about, oh my gosh, what can I, just Tim and Julie, this podcast, their book, their coaching, I just, I need to get them something extra special. Listen, we've made it so easy for you. All we ask for you to do is give us a five-star review on iTunes. That's it. If you're looking for the perfect Christmas present for Julie and I. <laughs> give and us I know a, you are. I know you are. Give us a five-star review on iTunes. We love being part of your lives every day. Uh, we've, it's, it's our honor and our pleasure uh, to be your podcast hosts. And hopefully one, one day we'll you know, be your real estate coaches and your EXP sponsors. And we can continue our relationship and go to the next level. But what we're asking for all of you to do is please do consider giving us a five-star review on iTunes. It really does mean the world to us. It tells iTunes that you like the podcast and that other people might that are similar to you might like the podcast and help us helps us to expand the people that we can um, obviously help in this industry. There's a lot of misinformation out there. Many of you discovered us after, unfortunately, you've succumbed to a lot of the misinformation. You know, you realize this is you know what we're saying is makes sense. It's practical. It's tactical. It's fluff free. I'm sure there's, you'll agree, 
that if you want better real estate agents, if you want better co-ops, why don't you start with basically giving them better information so that they can essentially be building uh, essentially profound businesses that will have a positive impact on themselves and the people that uh, they do business with. So do give us a five-star review on iTunes. We'd certainly appreciate it. In the meantime, guys, we'll talk with you on the podcast tomorrow. If you uh, have any suggestions, criticisms, well, criticism should go to Julie. But if you have any suggestions or ideas for future podcasts, please feel free to text me directly, text, text, text at 512-758-0206, 512-758-0206. You guys have a fantastic day. We'll talk with you on the show tomorrow. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com. <laughs> <laughs>